Hello again, everyone. This is Ken Kibler, Director of Client Profitability for eTruck Biz. Our attendee list is climbing rapidly here. Uh, we're about a minute shy of the top of the hour. Uh, so uh, please sit tight as we allow the attendees to join. And uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, the attendee list seems to have leveled off. We have hit the top of the hour. So this is Ken Kibler, the Director of Client Profitability with eTruck Biz. I want to thank everybody for joining us today uh, as we uh, go through some of our normal things as well as some really good uh, tips and basics for the DRO that we believe will help you uh, run a more efficient and more profitable operation. So uh, as always, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat, and we will respond to those at the end. Uh, so Jeff, uh, if you would start to share your screen, we'll be ready to go here. As always, every week, we have to let you know that we that e -Trip is not door sponsored, approved, or otherwise affiliated with FedEx Group. And as always, we take a look at the volume this week. Not too different than previous weeks. Although, pickup packages, at least on the vans, looks like, looked like they were, showed a little life. That's good. Um, <clears throat> and then on the delivery side, the more macro side, doesn't look like anything really is going on over there. So, unless you see something very different out there, I think everybody's experiencing probably a pretty much steady amount of volume. But always with the steady volume, we want to make sure we're watching something real close. We want to watch our dispatches. Looks like they're, again, flat with the volume, which is actually good in this case because... Uh, over the last several weeks, there's been an increase in uh, driver productivity. That's real good. Or stops per dispatch. That's good. That's the only way you're going to fight the stagnant volume right now is to make sure you're watching how many dispatches um, you're putting on the road. Okay. So over in the, did anybody notice this category? There, everybody remember when FedEx, the Postal Service, and UPS, everybody had to announce it. Do you, do you remember when UPS, actually, whoever it was, uh, the headline here says, UPS wins air cargo contract with Postal Service, replaces FedEx. And everybody thought, oh, no, that's not good. UPS will replace FedEx as the dominant provider of domestic air cargo for the U.S. Postal Service for the first time in more than 20 years. By the way, it doesn't say that FedEx is totally out of it, but we're going to look at something here. Express Delivery Giant on Monday announced that the Postal Service has awarded its, it a significant contract to move the majority of the mail agency's cargo in the United States. The contract will take effect on September 30th and calls for a five-and-a-half-year minimum base term. It's a pretty long contract in the transportation industry, no question about it, according to the Postal Service. Together, UPS and the Postal Service have developed an innovative solution that mutually that is mutually beneficial and complements our unique, reliable, and efficient integrated network. The CEO of UPS said the Postal Service 
is one of FedEx's largest customers, but it was clear the relationship would change this year. The Postal Service has been shifting more air parcels to its ground network since 2021 as part of a productivity drive. Hmm. What's going on there? So they're moving air packages to their ground network. The agency's transportation strategy and sense reduce overall transportation costs by $3 billion over the next two years, including a billion air freight cost savings already achieved. Lower postal volumes have left FedEx with the excess fixed infrastructure, infrastructure in its daytime air network and higher operating costs per unit. FedEx officials have said the contract with the Postal Service was barely breaking even and that they were prepared not to renew the contract if better terms couldn't be arranged. FedEx's revenue from its Postal Service contract in fiscal year ending September 30th, 2022, fell 232, $236 million to $1.9 million. It was expected to continue decreasing. The contract previously generated an average revenue of at least $2 billion. So, what does that tell us? That tell us, tells us that a couple of things here. One, apparently FedEx was moving postal service packages during the day when the planes were just sitting there doing nothing. But there's more. So lower volumes from the Postal Service meant lower what we call in the business load factor on daytime flights. Right. So the Postal Service was they they just the Postal Service said, hey, we're going to take some of those packages off those flights and put them on the road. Hmm. Does that sound familiar yet? So what does losing the contract mean? Again, daytime flight operations and, uh, yeah, pilot staffing are likely targets for reductions once the air transportation contract expires in September. Pilot staffing. One likely target in the company's just adjustments is daytime flights, which the Postal Service frequently uses. FedEx could cut 50% of its daytime flight capacity and save $1.5 billion without a contract in place, Barclays analysts said in February in a February re research. $1.5 billion are going to save by not hauling the not flying the half-empty planes for the postal service. Right. So oh yeah. You hear about the pilot strike? The pilots take hard a harder line in contract as, as contract disputes drag. Why well, do you think the contract disputes are dragging on? Probably because there's not there's too many pilots and not enough flights. <laughs> That's right. Too many pilots. Probably not going to be enough flights. Oops. But wait a minute, doesn't FedEx ship a bunch of stuff through the air? Well, they sure do. So how will you make up for these planes no longer flying? Well, <laughs> we looked last week or week before. We looked at something, didn't we? We looked at the top uh, revenue transportation companies. Right, and there's two of them up there, and guess what? UPS has a little more revenue, but oh, look at that! They only have, according to this, it says they only have sixteen thousand four hundred and forty tractors. But FedEx, hmm, says they have thirty-eight thousand tractors. What does that mean? Oops, it means. Too much power for the packages in the network. It means, why does my thing not work here? 
Anyways, it means, yeah, well, it means what they're doing is they're just going to run their air packages on the ground. Oops. Guess who else said they're going to do that? The Postal Service said they're going to do that. Postal Service said they're taking their air packages, taking them off of FedEx plane, their planes, and they're putting them on the ground. Well, why can't FedEx do the same thing and save $1.5 billion? So just... As an aside, we heard a lot of folks were very interested in this uh, subject. They thought that all the uh, smart post was going away, that kind of stuff. That's not what this was about. This was about this capacity on the daytime aircraft and the uh, pilot strike and everything else. And it's about saving a billion and a half dollars. Right. So it doesn't really it's not necessarily a bad thing. For FedEx now. Well, what happens to UPS? I don't know, but they might have to put that volume on their planes. And if the Postal Service keeps taking it away, they're going to have the cost problem, not FedEx. Okay. Here's that now. Get this going again. So Last week, there was a, we'll call a, call it a DRO incident. So what can or should contractors do in anticipation of this happening again? Because guess what? It's probably going to happen again. We're going to have Bob Teal, our operations engineering consultant and certified routing professional via route smart give us some information on what happened and how to prepare for the inevitability of it happening again so mr bob all right <laughs> thanks jeff thanks ken the night the lights went out in the dro um i know most of you probably if you if it didn't affect you directly at the time i'm sure you'd heard something about it either via Facebook or, you know, from the terminal next morning or whatever. But yeah, the DRO did go out and it, it, it did affect everybody, but it did not affect everybody. That being said, you know, East Coast 8, a, or 8 p.m. starts at 8 p.m. At that point, you know, Central and Mountain are not working yet. Um, I don't know if it got into the Central time zone, but I think by the time mountain and pacific were starting i think they already had it resolved but yes there there was an issue and it was system wide it wasn't just you know someone in specific or, or whatever it was system wide um and how to prepare for that you know in your dro you've got your route plan scheduled and as long as that schedule is up and is current for what you normally run you're gonna you're gonna be fine. It's gonna run um, as long as you've got something in there. And I I don't I don't know if you can even put nothing in there anymore. I think you, once you've got something in there, it's gonna run. But you know what? What you want to do though, like every week, what I do come Sunday is I go through. I do DRO for one client, and every Sunday I, I do all my prep for the week make sure that the normal routes are in of what we normally run based on what the trends are. Um, by looking at the trends, I've got all, you know, I've got routes set up by number of stops. And if they fluctuate from what the DRO says, I, I do look at the DRO as well. I know it's off, but I do look at that as well, just to gauge in the past four weeks versus the e-truck biz trends and those actually come out closer to the day-to-day, -day, the trends in your e-truck biz under your uh, your WSW analysis. But as long as you look at that stuff and you spend a little bit of time working on it, getting those numbers right, it makes it so much easier. Um, if you do a lot of swapping at night, you know, it could take you forever to, 
in a situation like this where you run to that deadline and you you run out of time and you're and you're stuck um so if, if you do a lot of swapping adjusting anchors moving things to one to another you know are you are you balancing your workloads at night are you balancing them in the morning um one thing that really helps with it is using your um My gosh, I just forgot. Your anchors, your um the dynamic anchors. Dynamic anchors. Thank you, Ken. If you're using the dynamic anchors will help in the long run because what it's gonna do is, you know, you got your plan set. Those dynamic anchors are, are gonna still balance everything where you don't have to worry about doing the balancing. If you're doing all the balancing at night. There, there's an easier way. It's change, yes, but I've got several clients that I work with. Actually, 80% of my clients use the dynamic anchors. Um, I would say at least three nights a week. Um, most of them are using them, you know, every night of the week. But it just makes everything easier, especially in a situation like this. And then all of a sudden, you know, that DRO doesn't work. It's just spinning and spinning and spinning. You got panic mode. So if you set your DRO up right, set it up by number of stops. You look at your trends on what you plan to use. Look at the volume and you just verify once a week, you know, you're going to be in good shape. And again, by using the dynamic anchors, you're not moving stuff in the morning. It's all happening in the DRO because it's going to balance everything. It's going to balance your, you know, your stops on the van. It's going to balance your hours for all your drivers. This here is a look at just the, a route plan schedule. This here, this graph right here. This in here is, you know, where we create our plans. And it's hard to see, but like, we got a 1300 stop plan and we've got like three or four different ones. And what that is, is we start out with one and then, okay, can we make it better? So we just copy it, call it something different and use that and then test it in the sandbox. And if it's something that's viable, then we move it over to the production screen that way. You know, at night, you know, we could spend a little bit of time for that next day looking at that route. Does this make sense? And if it does, then we use it. But it's continuously trying to improve your routes. And the more time you can spend during the day, you know, in the sandbox testing, and even at night, you know, you don't, don't want you spending two and three and four hours. I spend, you know, normally anywhere from a half hour to an hour a night, and that's it. And that is a lot of just trying to get it too perfect, which, you know, I don't know what perfect is in the DRO world. I don't know if they're ever, if you can ever get to exactly perfect. Although I do try to get to beat the computer's um, informed optimal. And, you know, I'll do that from time to time. Hey, Bob. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how many folks that when they started working with you, how many already you had different plans for different volume levels already set up? None. Zero. And why, the, why don't people do that? Um change something different another way to look at it maybe they haven't thought about it looking at it that way you know it's always been monday plan it's always been tuesday plan or monday through friday whatever it's just a it's right, another day to it's another day to look at it and, and what we do you know will's on this call and this is his these are his plans but we look at the we look at the trends what we're looking at and if it's, 
you know, if, if it's 1390, we look at the 1300 plan to the 1410 plan or 1440 and, you know, decide which one's going to be best for that day based on things that we know, our trends, um, volume was volume lower today than it was um, prior Tuesdays. Is there something that FedEx told us that, hey, the volume may be a little bit higher tomorrow or we want to use the higher plan? Or did we, or, or was it opposite? Did we run more today than normal? So, you know, chances are maybe tomorrow we're going to have a little bit less and we run that 1300 plan versus the 14. So you're saying, plan. so you're saying we ought to have plans based on anticipated volume, not necessarily the day of the week. Correct. So my question to everybody that's listening on this call right now, do you just ask yourself or, you know, is that how you got it set up? Do you have it? Do you have your operation engineered so that you have a plan based on incoming or anticipated volume? Not just what day of the week it is. If you don't, when you get into time definite land, this is going to bring out a whole new sense of urgency here, which is a whole nother subject, another day of some something else. So if you don't and you want to, I can get a hold of Ken or Bob or one of us and we'll get you hooked up with Bob and he can help you out setting up some of these plans here. And, and two, Jeff, the time definites, it's going to make a big difference when those start coming in. Because if you're using the, the the dynamic anchor, it just makes it so much, it gives the computer more options on where to put those stops. And the more options you give it, you know, the better. In, in some cases, um, we've got area, you know, four work areas around an anchor, you know, why not? Send them all into there and you can either make it dynamic for all of them or you can make it just so one anchor picks it up. But if you if you give the computer options, you're gonna be better off. And, so and Bob, yeah. So when 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 the DRO went down, uh what it would have done then is just take the previous plan that was uh listed in there, correct? Yeah, whatever plan you have, if if you know if you run on Wednesdays for tomorrow, if you run th the thirteen hundred plan and you ran it last week, whatever plan is in tomorrow is going to be the one that runs. Okay, so and if you did not have dynamic anchors uh, listed, you could probably have two drivers. Uh, that bump up against each other and one might end up with a nine and a half hour plan and one might end up with a six and a half hour plan. Yeah. If, if, if you spend a lot of time doing <laughs> swaps at night, then yes, definitely. Okay. But if you had dynamic anchors listed, it would balance, balance. out and might even yes. spread that um, rather than just two, it might spread it out across four drivers and therefore balance the workload. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Correct. And that's the benefit of the dynamic anchors is minimizing the swaps from one work area to another. You know, it's doing it for you. It makes it easier. Less thinking we have to do overall, the better. But you got to plan for it. You know, it's going to balance your workload. Keeps routes from blowing out by moving stops or bulk to another route while still balancing your hours. And just less to worry about if the DRO system should go down and you can't submit your plan. You know, that's that's just the scariest part. Plus, the biggest benefit is less time spent on DRO at night. You know, Will, you know, we met, we meet, we meet twice a week and me, him, and his BCs, and we go over route plans and we rerun. Okay, what did yesterday look like? What did um, Saturday look like? 
we can do that. We can look at the past and see if it's making sense because the past is going to, you know, you, your, your service area is this never going to change. You know, it's the size as it is until something happens, whether it grows. It's not the only way it grows organically is if you have, you know, subdivisions going up or if you're downtown, you got skyscrapers going in. Other than that, it's not going to grow. So as long as you have the plan set up, these work and it ensures your time definites have a shot of getting completed on time. Hey, hey Bob. Yes. Why don't we just let the drivers figure out if they can do the time definites on time? You know, they, you can do it however you want. But if you want to make sure you're capitalizing on the extra money, less stress from FedEx because they're not coming after you in the morning. That's what they do. That's what they have to do because if they don't do it, then they're condoning that it's okay. Same thing we should do with our drivers. If they don't get them done, why not? We, you know, we don't have to make it confrontational. We're just having a conversation. Why, why did we miss today? What part do you understand that these have got to be delivered on time? Have the conversation. This here allows more than one work area to go into the anchor. You know, it looks like a duck. The top part is one route and the bottom part is another route. That's what the dynamic anchors does. Now, why should either one of those have to go all the way up or down through that anchor? Again, same here. Some of these are intermixed. You know, it looks like maybe even close to the, real close to each other, but is that like a bulk stop? Is it balancing the queue? And to add to this, once again, it's about changing culture. Your driver's like, that's not my route. It's not my route. Starting to change the culture now. Uh, and utilizing the dynamic anchors will help you now, and it will make the transition uh, to the oh, network 2.0 express delivery. Oh, this anchor here is a single dynamic, meaning only one route can go into there. So you see, it's you know it's got four different routes around it. Let the computer decide who needs to go in there. We like to think we're smart, but we're still, we can, we're not as smart as that computer. We can't be. Another thing to do too, to even, you know, keep it balanced. Say you've got a new person in there and you don't want them having 120 stops. You only want, you know, 80 or 100 on them. You know, you utilize them in max function. That will help. Keep it balanced to where you want it. So you're saying if you have a, a new driver on a route and you can lower that min max, it'll move work to adjacent areas and then allow that driver to get up to speed naturally. Correct. Through training. Yep. And it'll spread the work out rather than adding two people to a route when you're starting a new driver then. Perfect. Spot on. Going to even out the workload. And again, you know, work days are going to be better balanced. Even, and you may find that you're running too many routes. You know, if, if everyone is under their men, why are we going to run that route, that route plan? Let's look at a new route plan. And again, I've, I've talked to DRO again about their the highlighted 58, 65, 71 on there. That's all. It, it highlights it if it's under or over. Still trying to get them to implement something where it shows us the min-max either by hovering it or some other signification. Uh, they've said that maybe they could even have it put in the columns there beside it. That way we can visually see because 
you know, unless you know exactly what they are, those highlights are useless. But again, this is just another tool to help balance the workload. And that's all the people want. They want to come in that they, they, they want to come in and know, okay, that okay, I'm gonna be out for this long. Now, if we send them out for seven hours one day and four hours the next, they're going to want four hours all the time. But if they all of a sudden they come in, they're out for seven, seven and a half, eight every day, every day, every day. You know what? They're fine. They're going to be okay. And again, it's, the, it's just the culture. Change behavior, change faces. But this will help in the midst of a DRO outage like we had last week. And again, it was system-wide. It just didn't hit some people out on the West Coast and through Central U.S. because it hadn't, their time wasn't, hadn't started yet to do the DRO. Okay, so what you're saying is a little bit of thinking about it, planning beforehand, doing a little bit of work, get you through DRO outages. Yes. <clears throat> yes, it will. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Bob. Now, I don't know exactly how we're going to do this, but I guess we're going to try to have some sort of poll. Oh, do you see something on your screen? I do. You do? What do you see on your screen? There's contract quarterly contractor survey. Well, that's cool. <laughs> Not sure how this works. How does this work? I guess we ask ask the question, huh? What are the top challenges you currently face in managing your business? So, how do the folks out there answer? Does anybody have any idea? I, can I defer to Jenna on this? I would love to. Somebody figured it out. One. <laughs> yeah, you should just, they should just be able to click it. Oh. So click away, if you would. So two out of 48 folks are watching. There we go. Now we got three. Three. Three out of 48. Good. Oh, look out. It's an avalanche. Four. There we go. I guess everybody, I didn't know how to do it either. Go, go, go. So, so far, it looks like rising overhead costs are winning. We ought to bet on these. We could have a, we could have a thing. Bet. Draft Kings would have liked to get in on this. And they can, Jeff, if you want to read the other ones too down there, they they can go through all four of them at once. Oh, I don't go to the next one? Or I, I guess I, this is how I do it. Aha, look at this. What resources or tools do you feel you are currently lacking that would make a significant difference in your operational efficiency? Please answer now. We need some music too, probably. Wait, if, does number two only have an, one answer? Uh, number two is a uh, free form, so they can type in specifically. Oh, well, but we can't see the answers. I can. You can't? I can't see them, but what do I need to see them for? There you go. Well, you should see res results by launch and results up at the top. Well, let's, yeah, let's do number three. Looking ahead, what are the biggest challenges you anticipate while adapting to Network 2.0? Ah, this is interesting. Uh, 
hours, staff. Yeah. <laughs> Number four, what topics would you most like to learn about in our next training session or webinar? All right. All right. Hey, that's pretty cool. I didn't know you could do that. I think we'll start doing these in the morning. How's that? I can leave it up for a few minutes. If you guys want to start um, kind of doing open Q&A, we can leave this up for a minute while you guys are working through those. Okay. okay. I'll go down to the Q&A. Uh, first one, uh, we run an average volume for the last two to three months with notes for out of norm events for notes for last year. I think what Dave was uh, saying is how he kind of uses the DRO to plan. Uh, and that is excellent. Yeah. Plan Utilizing three months of data is definitely sufficient. Even if you just have that last month, you, you can see some pretty good trends by day of the week. Uh, anything to add to that, Bob? Um, no, no. And, and two, with your, I use four weeks. I used to use six weeks, but four weeks just seems to be working better right now. But when the volume drops like it has, you know, it's always good to have trends that we can go back from prior years to look at as well. Exactly. Like some like levels if, and... Around like holidays is a big time to go back to the previous year. I know when I was a senior manager, we had what was called, and Jeff can remember this as well, the holiday logs. Because mm. you wanted to know what your volume was the day before, the day after, and uh, the day of the holidays, just because it, it does affect you. So historical data is valuable. Next one, Bob, and you might have to reach out to him uh, from Sa Santiago Molina. How do we set up the dynamic anchors? I don't know if you can explain that, Bob. Yeah, the dynamic anchors, that's just done in your route plan, create. You got to go in and edit it. And in the far left-hand corner, there's a box. You just got to click that box. And, but um, I'll reach out to you. So yeah, you and, and before you do it, I think you, you definitely want to talk to your team about it uh, because it's going to change their world. As I said, drivers got very used to saying, that's not my route. And the BC would say, you're right, it's not your route. So uh, and the routes change with that dynamic uh you, you know i would say 90 percent of the route remains the same every day but 10 percent is going to change and that's change and sometimes change is fear and change is resistant so next one when do the dynamic anchors finalize the numbers it's using is it when you finalize your plan or does it continue to update until we time out i'll leave that it one to you bob it continues to update the best I know, it continues to update. Um, but for the most part, everyone, everyone right now is in their own area still 80% to 85% of the time. Um, it's only fluctuating probably about 15% east, north, south, or west. So again, if you if you're in a if you got rural area along with you know, a lot of density in a city and that city is getting 70% of your volume. So you, you can figure, even if you get more after that, 70% of it is going to go to your density. So you're not going to have to have a, an, a rural area all of a sudden just blowing out. It's not going to happen. So the dynamic anchor in that for a rural area would be kind of where that those that work area bumps up against another work area, correct, in a decent sized town. Is that is that how it would work, Bob? Yeah, and I guess rural area, I'm thinking of um, not your major metro. But if you're out and you've got one or two small towns, those one or two small towns, they're still going to get the majority of that work areas stops. 
you may still get one or two runners, but but you're not going to all of a sudden just get, you know, 30 or 40 chasers on one of your more rural routes. Does that make sense? Does that make more sense? Yeah, I, that does to me. Another one, it says, while having a plan for DRO is great, but we've had multiple occasions where the terminal could not submit the final DRO and resorted back to yesterday's plan. Is that where dynamic anchors will really help that, Bob? They didn't submit one, so it went back to yesterday's plan. Yeah, the, the dynamic anchors are always going to help no matter what. But what it, what sounds like happened, instead of running, we're setting up for tomorrow and say tomorrow we've got 12 routes. We only have 10 on Tuesdays because it's lighter. The terminal didn't submit, and what happened is it ended up running 10 routes. So it sounds like the whole terminal's a mess, and I would definitely um, send an email to BDS about that. That can't, that can't happen. That cannot happen. And that's something you definitely want to document because <clears> – <throat> It is costing you money uh, and something that you, on your quarterly business review, you want to be able to have those dates for the station as well. Uh, you, you know, just because they're holding you accountable doesn't mean you don't get to hold FedEx accountable as well. And <laughs> so that's I your would... employee morale as well. I mean, that's, that's where you're really losing. Because they're all going to be upset now. So, so make sure you do document that, uh, especially if it's happening, you, you know, once, twice a month. I mean, that's enough. Uh, one bad dispatch a week can think about it. If you run a six day week operation, it, it, you know, one day is 16%. If you fail on 16%, I mean, last I checked that we get you an 84 on a test. Yeah, you're passing, but you're not, you're, you're certainly not thriving. Okay. So uh, make sure you document, hold the, hold the station accountable when they do not put out uh, a, a plan, because that does affect your profitability, your productivity, your driver morale, and that driver morale just runs downhill. So, <clears throat> all right. Uh, it's how the surveys finish here. Uh, Jeff, anything you want to add on the surveys or on those questions? Because it looks like we are out of questions. Well, well, there's folks looking for information on Network 2.0. And quite honestly, we thought we were going to have an entirely different presentation today based on something that was supposed to happen on Friday. But it didn't happen yet. Um, I think we can tell you if you're looking for an integration coming your way express to your operation, you might be looking at July ish. Maybe now we'll see. We'll see which way the wind blows every day, but that's the uh, we heard that. And that's about all I'm gonna say about network 2.0 right now. I said too much. Okay. Well, it looks like that's all of our questions, Bob. Anything you have to, any final comments on DRO? Um, just try it. Get in your sandbox and try it. If you have questions, feel free to reach out. Hey, you want to go through these survey things? We can do that. Okay. So we've can got uh, first question. What are the top challenges you currently face in managing your business? Uh, number one answer, rising overhead costs. N no doubt about it. Uh, and we definitely encourage you to uh, track your costs. Uh, that's one thing that eTruck Biz plans to expand this year is to help you understand what your cost per dispatch is. Uh, there, there is a form uh, called the exchange of information that FedEx was supposedly trying to standardize and, and have you submit. 
they've done a really, really bad job of standardizing it, even getting the formulas correct on it. Uh, but uh, ask your station for it if they will not provide that. Uh, email me and I can get you a copy of that exchange of information sheet. I think it's a, a great tool to work with and, and something that, like I said, is we plan on integrating into our software uh, because the, the overhead costs are there. Uh, some things you can control, some things you cannot control uh, in, in there. But uh, we always say work on the things that you can control. Your labor is one that you can control. Uh, if you do have to pay employees more, what do you have to do? You've got to get more revenue out of them. UPS just gave their drivers a pretty nice increase. Guess what they got in return? They got productivity concessions uh, uh, in return. So therefore, they will generate more revenue to pay for that uh, that raise that they just gave their drivers. Uh, driver retention and recruiting. Uh, we firmly believe uh, that balancing the workload will help with that. Uh, we can definitely help with recruiting. Uh, I think the biggest thing to successful recruiting is doing it all the time. Uh, I was always told you don't go shopping when you're hungry because you end up buying a lot of things that you're not going to eat uh, or you don't need. So you want to recruit drivers when you are fully staffed. So you are not taking what's available. You you want the best of what's available. Uh, next one was managing drivers. It's been something that has been avoided. It's a 900 pound elephant in the room. Uh, a lot of times BCs were just really good drivers. Managing drivers requires leadership requires communication, accountability, and, and so much more. Those are things that we can definitely help you with. If you are not uh, part of our coaching program, I, I definitely, you know, encourage you to reach out. But managing drivers is something that you have to do every single day. UPS does it every single day. And Think about it. They've got the union to mess with. Uh, it, you know, they got a third party uh, intervening in, in progressive discipline there. You don't have to worry about that, but you still want to be able to do it fair. Uh, but it has to be done. Next, managing administrative and compliance task. Boy, do we have a tool for you there. We, we got something called our white glove services. Take that off of your plate so you can work in your operation and somebody else can work behind the scenes in your operation. Uh, operational inefficiencies and meeting service requirements have, uh, have, have tied with 8% and boy, are they tied together. An inefficient operation will produce very poor service results. Uh, once again, encourage coaching, uh, engineering, routes change over time, uh, volume might not change, but where that volume is hitting can change over time. Uh, if you're not managing drivers, you will see abilities change over time as well. Anything to add to all those, Jeff? No, it's just interesting. Yeah. And you said it, uh, the, your costs, um, that is the area of focus next. We think yeah, we have yeah. the, uh, there, by the way, there's a new version of what we call the driver app or e-route coming out. Uh, it's probably, not probably, it is the very best version of that we've got out there so far. And We'd like to tell you that it's probably better than anything out there for routing anymore. So I know people in the past, oh, we don't use it because this and that. Well, you need to take another look at eRoute because not only is it likely better than what the folks are using right now, it incorporates the time definite um, issues. And we've been told by FedEx that it's the best uh, 
entrant in the market right now for, for time definite tracking and making sure people get time definites done. And can it's probably cheaper than what you're spending right now, by the way. Absolutely. Anyway. Um, go ahead. All right. What resources or tools do you feel you are currently lacking that could make a significant difference in your operational efficiency? Uh -oh. that I don't know. That you want to, I don't know if you want to read all those. I don't know. That didn't work for me. Do what? Okay. So I can't, I can't see the details of what got answered, what got responded there. I can't see those kind of kick me out of the meeting. Um, I can't. Oh, wait a minute. Ah, oh, well, where's a continuous dynamic plan, continuous dynamic route planning tool. Not sure what that is. Another answer is this time of year, drivers flake out in our area. It happens every year. Okay. It's kind of strange because your volume is flat, steady. Uh, Actually, this is the best time to make, if you are uh, in need of an upgrade, <clears throat> this is probably the best time of year to, to consider upgrading your poorest and biggest concerns. We'll just put it that way. Another resource or tool you feel you're currently lacking is case studies and how best to find and integrate part-time drivers. Okay. Proper numbers on packages and dispatch times. Yep. Wish that would happen. Consistency on the part of FedEx. So just as a general statement there yeah everybody would like that but i'm going to tell you for the next two three four years ain't gonna happen i can Correct tell line. you yeah the airplane adds another dynamic and no, no doubt about it uh because it's an it's another trailer arrival per se uh and, and it, you know weather might be great in your area but it might not have been great in memphis so uh, that, that, that can definitely, it will affect dispatch times. And, you know, we've seen that with, uh, the station that, uh, I've been working with around here. So it's, it's another dynamic. So to say that consistent dispatch times will get better, I'd be lying to you. Another thing here says correct volume in the DRO. So there's all kinds of things going on with that volume in the DRO, right? And and the result is, and I don't know, people don't, I know you don't care about what all the games are getting played. You just want something that's right. And I think everybody does, <clears throat> but that's why if Bob will tell you, we tend to want you to look at your historical volume versus what's in the DRO. You can take the both of them and kind of average it out and get a good feel. That's probably the best way, but I'll, we would lean more on your historical volume than anything else. Is that right, Bob? Ken? Yep. Yep. Absolutely concur. Historical data is extremely valuable and tends to be more accurate. So. Especially now since we're getting away from the snow days and everything else. Yeah. You know, that definitely affects a lot of it during the winter, but now that we're hopefully coming out it out of it from uh, maybe excluding Colorado and a few other states, you know, it should get more uh, consistent. Something else here in this, what you'd like to see, cost comparison tool for truck utilization and replacement. Be careful what you ask for. That's all we're gonna say there. Additional re revenue and management training, like more revenue and management training. Management training. Next one, could you see number three? There, Ken. Do you want to do it? Huh? I got number three question pulled up. Is that what? 
you were saying? I guess I, I, that's what I'm saying. Well, well okay. just here, don't you don't have to read all these. You're looking at yeah. what are the biggest challenges you anticipate adapting to Network 2.0, and the biggest response was making making time commitments and managing service. That's right. It is going to be a shock to the system, uh, along with everything else. But yeah, that's interesting. And then fourth thing here, running out of time there, Ken, what topics would you like to most learn about in the next sessions? The announcement, we talked about that. Staffing vari variations, including pay. You mentioned a couple of weeks ago how on call part time or guaranteed five hours per day, 20 hours per week. You know, maybe Mr. Wade would like to come out of retirement. That's exactly what I was thinking. If we can pry him from the golf course, maybe. <laughs> the king of the part-timer. We might, there There you go. That, will make, that might be something here pretty soon. We're, we're going to we're gonna have to bribe him. He's working on that club championship and everything, but we might be able to get him to make it. <laughs> So okay. look like we've added a couple questions as well. Oh. Uh, go back here. Uh, it says another contractor asked me if my contract date was moved as they were in a group of contractors that all got pushed to 927. Any word on why this is? Uh, they might ask you to sign an extension. Uh and, I mean, that could be due to some realignments of CSAs that I think Jeff has mentioned once or twice on here. Uh, they could be realigning some zip codes as well to align with the express network. Anything else that you could think of, Jeff or Carrie? I don't know. Could be many things. So I don't know that it's something to get too excited about or not yet. Don't know. It, if you told me where you were, I'd probably give you a better answer. Let's just put it that way. But, but it, just go to the it, next question. It, it could be several things. It says, what should your payroll be for your BCs? Uh, the model that we've been told is one BC. 14 routes uh if you are a six-day operation you say my bc can't work six days a week i don't want them working six days a week then you probably would have a lead driver uh handle the light dispatch day which would be saturdays uh and the other thing you really don't have to worry about is uh time committed pickups on saturdays as well so uh but uh think in terms of that uh it goes their their pay goes into what's called general and administration, and your general and administration category should make up sixteen and a half percent of your revenue number. I think that might be the best way to answer it, unless somebody else has something to add to that. All right. All right. Now, Bob, this would be for you. Is there any way to have DRO consider historical data when using dynamic routing? No, not at this time. But you can, you know, if you've got a large subdivision, say it gets 50 stops, you can bet, you know, on your light days, you're going to probably get, you know, 40. Heaviest days, you're going to get 60. And you may see it go up a little bit you know, over time, like, you know, two, three, four stops over the course of three weeks. But again, that's how much time is that extra taking? I hope this helps. Hope, hope this helps answer your question. No, it does not take into effect any historical data. But your subdivisions, you know, they're, everything's going to grow incrementally. Another good question. Do you see Issues with outdated buildings, when they make the choice, how fast do they update buildings and complete the integrations? Uh, outdated buildings uh, have been around forever. I think they are taken into consideration uh, more so the leases, I would think, 
uh, when they're when they're making choices as to where you, you know which building would serve an integrated uh, ground and express network. They, they, it's hard for them to move quickly on those because of the leases. FedEx does not own buildings they other than their hubs. Uh, so it, it, it comes into effect, uh, but the outdated buildings, uh, <laughs> a lot of times uh, they'll put some money into them, but if they can build another one, uh, that would be an auto satellite that can handle express and ground. That's their first option. But what, five years from planning to implementation, uh, Jeff, on uh, a new building? Well, I mean, Dell, I don't know. I don't know that I totally understand, but they'll do what they got to do. I mean, it's not, they don't say, well, we've been, most of the time, FedEx would do a lease. If they do a lease on a building, there's always an out to the lease. There's no way that they would sign a lease without some kind of out. So if the question is, if they got old buildings, you're going to keep them, stuff like that, they'll do whatever they got. Money's not the necessarily the issue there. If that's the question. Or... Very good question here. Unique characteristics. Would stem time to route, which is ETA, one hour, 10 minutes. Dispatch time, 9.15. We have 10 o'clock. Our, our 12 o'clock commitments, would this be a unique characteristic? The way you would do that is you would have to say how many time commitments do you average uh, per, per work area that have to be delivered? So you would have an hour and a half if you're going to hit that if you're going to hit the the plus work your area at yeah, 10 plus your miles per, plus your miles per stop and plus your miles per stop and what how many square miles the are, is the work area there's there's a whole bunch of other things in there too but yeah you'd have to see how you many try. yeah without a doubt hey, you want to know how many stops your driver can get done in that hour and a half uh it was actually argued here in a uh, facility close to me and and what was happened, they actually adjusted the planned dispatch time because it, they've moved it from 9.30 to 9.45 and that did budget each CSP another uh, route for or, or another dispatch that FedEx would then compensate them for, so. It, it's definitely worth doing. You're going to have to do a little bit of math on it. Uh, but if a driver can only do 12 stops per hour and they're going to have, you, you know, 20 stops to get done in an hour and a half, then that would require an extra dispatch. So that would be something that, that I would definitely try to submit as a unique characteristic. Okay, we're up against the hour. <laughs> Uh, lots of great questions, lots of great feedback on the survey. Uh, so I think we'll put those survey results out, I'm sure. I want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, Jeff or Bob, anything you want to add? Just thanks for filling out the survey, those of you that did. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, expect, yeah, you know, it's great that we hear that we want to hear, you know, some more training and stuff that we think we're very good uh, at sharing knowledge uh, with you and, and hopefully putting together a training course. Uh, we just need attendees to come to those training courses. So uh, we look forward to seeing everybody here next uh, Tuesday again. Please have a safe and profitable week. Thank you very much.